Are there any issue? Just do us a sign uh, where you are visible. Thank you. I think. Uh, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, I think we can uh, switch to. This, yeah, will be better. Yeah. Hi everyone. So Hugo, Paul, Julien. Yeah. Um, today we're going to do the 2.10 live stream. Uh, go over a, a series of features we want to highlight and showcase. Uh, so Julien will we'll start with uh, specific stuff uh, regarding the editor, and we'll, uh, we'll continue from there. Uh, give it, uh, Right, uh, so in uh, 2.10, we did a big uh, revamp of the uh, UI, especially on high DPI displays. So before 2.10, uh, if you had uh, a screen mix of high DPI and regular screens, so 4K screens and a regular screen, the UI would be completely messed up when you switch we're switching windows from one screen to the other, so all that is fixed. Uh, we also did a big pass on uh, different uh, icons. Uh, we revamped the menus. Uh, everything is a bit more uh, polished. Uh, we also added a pretty neat uh, tool, uh, which is searching the property grid. So uh, I'll just open whatever this one to show you. So here, if I go in the physics, you have uh, in the physics node you have this little button here where you can search uh, for items in the property grid. So this is this has been asked for a while, and it's pretty neat to have it. Uh, also, nope, wrong button. You now have a search bar in the templates list. Uh, which is also pretty useful if you have uh, lots of templates in some files. Like if you're making you a, a, a template file for your entire project and have tens or hundreds of templates, it's a pretty nice thing to have. And uh, same thing for the attributes. You can now search your attributes. Uh, well, I don't have attributes in that, that effect, but uh, uh, also I did a, a few visual clues in different pa panels. You have, for example, this little link here as a shortcut to add attributes. Same thing for the content browser. When you go in folders, which are uh, empty, you can add assets and all that. Uh, anyway, so I will go back to the launcher to show you the next uh, big thing, uh, which is the package library revamp. Uh, so before 2.10, it was a simple list of uh, four or five packages that we didn't change since version one. And now we extended this uh, to support more packages. Uh, so right now, there aren't that many, but the goal is to add more and more packages as time goes by with uh, simple effects at first so that you can easily drag and drop in your game engine to populate your uh, game world with uh, effects that you typically find. So we have a bunch of explosions here, some fires, some environment effects. You can also take a look at these and uh, use them as starting points to tweak them or uh, make them your own. Uh, same thing, little search uh, here. Uh, if I search pyro, I get all the, the flame effects. So pretty pointless when all the effects fit in one screen right now, but as this will be expanded, we'll also add categories and things like that. Uh, one thing to note uh, here, this package uh, was actually sent by uh, a user of our Discord. It's a bunch of pretty useful templates that he's made in version two, and he finds himself using uh, a lot. So we thought it would be useful for the community to, to have that. And this is also something we are uh, inclined to push in the future to allow you guys to make packages and to uh, make them available to the rest of the community through this. Uh, so right now we don't have any uh, 
interface to upload packages. So if you're interested in that, contact us and we'll uh, review the package, see if we think it fits the, uh, the kind of things we want to publish here. And uh, if it does, we'll be happy to make it available for others. So you can expect more news on, on that and more updates in the upcoming 2.11 and the next versions. Um, so uh, I'll actually show you how you can use that. Uh, so here you have little checkboxes, so you can control mouse wheel to make the thumbnails bigger. You have the little checkboxes on the top, which tells me here that these packages are downloaded. This one is not, so I have the, the download button here. So I'll quickly download it. And when you right click, you can create a new project from it. So uh, new project, yeah. that's a perfect name. I believe this one exists already. Oh, no. it exists already? Yeah, I might have created a project name. Okay, new project. just in doubt. <laughs> new project 2, that's... <laughs> Better. Right, so this is like the package import, the regular stuff you had behind, uh, before. So I will create project, and now if I go back into my project list... Okay, so I have both. <laughs> I remove that one. Uh, right, and now I can go open this effect. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. So a little torch fire, uh, pretty straightforward. It's a flipbook and a, a light that wiggles. It's quickly going to open the flipbook to show you. Yeah, nothing uh, extraordinary done here. Uh, just a simple effective effect. <laughs> effective effect. Yeah. Uh, so I'll show you the others. Uh, so here I created a new project from that, but you can also import into an existing project. So I re reuse that one. Here I can search the projects which are compatible with this package. So here I pick my new project to import. I also I will also import that. You can't right now select multiple packages and import all of them. So uh, I have to do this for every single one and this should be good right so now when i open that i have all those folders so here for for the packages right now we kind of follow the uh, ue4 style guide uh, by michael lr um, regarding the organization of uh, content uh, just because it yeah it makes sense uh, for us as well to organize it like that uh, makes it easier to import multiple packages from the online library uh, we'll see how we if we change that or not but right now it's organized the same way so you have one folder per package and inside you have the different effects so this one has a huge cube map that's why it takes a long time to load we don't cache the cube maps right now so uh, if it has a large AGR cube map, it will take uh, quite a bit of time to, to open. Uh, this one is pretty nice as well. It shows some falling leaves with a tumbling motion. I'm not sure how this will look in the stream. Maybe it won't be very visible, but uh, so it's using mesh particles. They lay flat on the ground. Pretty straightforward, but uh, yeah. And last one I'll show. A little campfire campfire effect same thing pretty simple flipbook based uh, just a uh, simple and effective that you can quickly use in a, in a project nice uh, right so i'll let paul show you the 3d improvements now yes so right now we'd like uh hello everyone we'd like to speak uh you about uh, the improvement we've done in l3d so for the one who, do, who don't know, uh, O3D is a new open source engine, um, which is currently in, uh, in a pre-release pre uh, status, so you can uh, download it and test it right now. Um, so we've done recently um, some work uh, on our O3D plugin. 
Um, first of all, uh, we've made the uh, installation uh, of the gem much more easy. Uh, you can now uh, just uh, register the gem and then go into your project configuration and use the project manager to simply activate the gem uh, like the other built-in gems. And then the project manager will uh, build it for you. So it's much better than uh, it used to be uh, before and we're still improving that part also. Um, we also worked recently on the Android gems. So we have something working, something compiling. Uh, so you should be able to test that uh, uh, if you if you need to, to compile an Android, even if the toolchain maybe is uh, still a bit rust now, but uh, it's something where uh, we have working on our side and we keep working on. And we've also, oh, that's unfortunate. I'll be back. Yeah. I think I need to uh, sing with my account to see this one. I think I'm just refresh this one. And okay. And watch the, uh, yeah. uh, okay, nice. So we've also made, oops. We've also made some, uh, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> I think I need to, to be logged in into my account because it's the video, it's not the same. Uh, let me just switch that quickly. Yeah, hang on. <laughs> As it waits. Yeah, thank you. Let's finish that so yeah. <laughs> Why is the video blocked to me? Uh, I think it's because it's on my drive. Yeah, it's, it's quite clear. It's like in private and not in this. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, I don't know exactly. <laughs> okay, right now. You switch back to. Um, just close with me. Okay. Yeah. So is um, it okay now? I think so. Yeah. Unable to play. Okay. You just play directly in the browser, maybe? Yeah, I can play this one from here. But... Does it work if you play it with me? Just take some hints at 48. Yeah, for some reason, video not working. Um, I'm logged in into my account. Yeah, it should, should work like that. Okay. Error 5. Okay, maybe we can get back to it. Yeah, we'll get back to it uh, a bit later. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. Um, maybe, maybe you can talk about the roadmap and I'm loading the video on uh, some other device, like on the shared, and we can just watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, coming back. All right, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, basically, I, men I mentioned that on the O3D e Discord uh, by text, but I think it's important to mention it here. Uh, we are going to continue developing the gem features on 2.9 LTS because we continue to to make the 2.9 version evolve. So for the next uh, maybe months or two months, we'll continue to implement features specifically for O3D e on 2.9. Uh, but uh, after one month or two, we'll, we'll switch to uh, 2.10 and stick with the uh, regular release cycles. Um, but here on the roadmap, we have a, a set of features planned. Um, I don't have them in mind right now, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, do we have them? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Share this with me. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you select uh, what's, uh, what do you switch? You need to focus on sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay, so sorry for that. Um some improvements uh, that have been done in the uh, O3D gem. Um 
are regarding uh, UI. So you know you have nice thumbnails and also nice icons. Um, thanks to Hugo. <laughs> yeah, it uses the thumbnails uh, that whatever you capture in Popcorn FX Editor, the thumbnail it's uh, displayed in O3D. Yep, yeah, exactly. Um, Just a small thing. Of the we city. also maybe. Um, we also implemented uh, two new renderers. So uh, for now, we had available billboards uh, and ribbon renderers. And now we will have in probably the next patch next week, uh, two more renderers, which are meshes and lights. So as you can see, those are well integrated in the built-in uh, lighting system of uh, O3D. And thanks to the design of the engine, we can handle uh, multiple lights. Here it works on opaque geometry, opaque, uh, but it also works on transparent geometry. So it's nice. We we still have a rendering improvement to do, and we, we we're still working on that. And I think, uh, as said, you go, we will we will be releasing uh, new patches uh, every week or every two weeks. And you can ex expect those improvements uh, as well as others rendering improvements in the next week. Yeah, now that I think about it, I forgot to mention. So the goal uh, about 2.10 is as we have all of the new assets from the package library in 2.10 only, you do not have access to those in uh, 2.9. We want to make sure all of the assets provided in the package library work by default in our 3DE without having to uh, hack, your way, hack your way around the shaders or or anything like that, so we will do the 2.9 to 2.10 to switch or whatever that's uh, that's uh, ready. That's what happened. But, uh, yep. That's really interesting. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's really good. It's good for me. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> let's close it. <laughs> yeah. So was that all for 3D? Uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe, I don't know, can I check the, the, the chat? Or... Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Nothing oh, special. Hi, hi that's chat. <laughs> nice uh, videos, by the way. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, so now I think Julien will uh, present us um, yeah. new presets. Uh, yeah, I'm just, just going to focus this. On, uh, just so that we see if there yeah, anything there are popping up. I believe we'll have to switch. Uh, ah, a question from Pinter. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, right now uh, we are targeting main branch because uh, the dev branch uh, has uh, yeah changing features quite regularly. It's a bit uh, painful for us to maintain every change that is done into dev branch. So for now, we stick with main. Uh, I think that probably uh, dev, dev branch changes will be merged to, uh, to main uh, at some point. And uh, at that moment, we will have to, to stick with this and to do the changes. Uh, for now, if you really want to compile on dev, uh, you can, I think, as you already did, uh, reach us uh, on the Discord. And yeah, for now, most of the changes are only a few lines to edit. So uh, we might help you to have it compiled on dev, but we, we stick to, to me for now. Uh, so next up, I'm going to show you the new presets. Um, so when you right click new effect, you now have a new dialog showing you with the animated thumbnails, the different presets. We changed those presets uh, compared to previous versions. We thought they were pretty useless <laughs> the way they were constructed. So now you have a burst and a fountain. We kept the old names because it would require upgrading uh, a special case of upgrade. Yeah, we didn't want to change that in, in 210. So they have the same names, but now they are more useful effects. Uh, and the nice thing Shit. Misclicked somewhere. <laughs> and the nice thing uh, is that you can add your own effects as presets. Previously, you could already do that, but you had to copy paste manually the effects into a special folder. Now we expose that in the UI. Uh, you can right click on an effect and do save as preset. Campfire, perfect. 
And now when I right click new effect, I see my campfire as a preset. So this can be pretty useful. Um, you also have the same thing for curves, actually. Uh, not sure where we have curves in there if we do, but I'll just drop uh, whatever whatever curve in here. And here we have this button. You can click on it. It will uh, prompt you to select an effect into which you want to place your curve. Uh, right now, you can't create a new effect from here. Uh, so if you scroll all the way down, you can see the curve presets of PKFX in library program FX core templates. This is where we store our presets. You shouldn't modify that. Uh, so instead, you should, should create your own effect in, in library or wherever. Uh, so here instead, uh, just to show it, I will save that in uh, Campfire 1 or FX Simple, whatever. Curve preset name, uh, blah. Here we go. And now when I click on the presets dump drop down, I see the black curve over That's there. A nice curve. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and right click on here, presets, blah, and I have my curve. Um, I think we had a question regarding Dev uh, 103D. Oh, the one I already uh, answered. Um, Are you sure? Uh, the Dev should. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, it said that uh, oh, you yeah, kept yeah. breaking Popcorn being on the Dev branch, and, and yeah, we. <laughs> We understand, and yeah, we we are yeah. up to help you for that. Uh, also, it also helps us because those are edits we will have to do anyway when those get magic. So, uh, so before continuing, I'm going to do a quick change in Project Launcher General. I will check the Keep Opened checkbox. This, uh, if by default it's not checked, which means that whenever you open a project, it will close the launcher uh, here because we keep opening it again. I'm checking it so I can open whatever project and uh, the project launcher stays open. Um, so one other thing I wanted to show you is this tab here, which is your local vault. Uh, so the local vault is just a place where you can um, store your packages and see them here. Uh, so basically when I, when I open a project and when I select a bunch of effects and right click export to package here uh, i can export so here it will be on the desktop uh, i can export these effects as a package which is basically a zip file um, oh by the way you also have some new package settings here where you can uh, choose a specific thumbnail uh, thumbnail uh, write a description for your package uh, etc this is what we use to, to publish those packages on the uh, package library but uh, so here I'll just export it as is. And uh, if I go to the vault and click browse here, it will show me the folder on my uh, disk where the, the vault is. It watches a folder basically. So here if I take the package I just exported and paste it here, you will see it appear there. So I have a bunch of other packages on my desktop. can paste them over here. And uh, if you go to the settings, to the project launcher settings under Vault, uh, you actually have additional paths, so you can uh, specify whichever path you want for that uh, watched folder to be, and you can add any number of uh, secondary paths. Uh, you can watch a net network drive, for example, if uh, if it's useful. Uh, so here, uh, to show you the new effect IDs that came in 2.10, uh, I will actually import this package into this project reopen that and uh, yeah it's this effect so this has been something that uh, has been requested for a while to be able to uh, get a unique effect instance id uh, every time you instantiate a new effect instance so uh, now it's uh, as simple as doing effect.id uh, so this is using a script but i believe we have a node now yeah we have an effect.id node 
uh, and this will give you an ID different for each new instance that spawns. This is useful to pick some uh, instance specific random values or things like that. Uh, next up, what do I have? Oh yes, attribute samplers. So if I open the attribute samplers effect, it must be this one. Yep. Uh, so in this effect, in the effect interface, we have a bunch of uh, sliders, colors, and also two attribute samplers. So uh, we have a mesh that can be changed in engine and a curve. And before 2.10, you wouldn't see the curve. You uh, wouldn't. You would only have a, a checkbox for the mesh to preview it on the animated backdrop, and it was pretty much a nightmare to set up, because inside the layers you had to wire in a um, mesh resource node into your mesh sampler, uh, into your attribute node, sorry, uh, and then you couldn't. You had no way to change it directly in the effect interface, and it was buggy. Sometimes you would be able to change the default mesh, sometimes you wouldn't. So we redid all that. And now it's much more straightforward when you select these. Uh, you have everything that you would see in the regular sampler node. So here I can change my default mesh. Uh, for example, here it, it says it's bound to the mesh backdrop. So I say no dynamic binding. You can see that I have a, a sphere. I can change that to whatever, a cone with some height. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. this, this is a much cleaner way to set up your default uh, attribute shapes in your effects and a way that actually works. <laughs> yes, yeah, so those are the default values, right? Yeah, these are the default values, yeah. And uh, that's almost all for me. Uh, Paul, you want to show the mesh viewer, maybe? Uh, yeah, but I think we have a question. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, definitely. So actually it relates uh, to a bit to what just uh, Julien were talking about. So this here uh, are what we call the attributes. Those are the parameters that can be accessed from the integration. So 3DE, Unreal, etc. cetera. Um, so Julien just presented the resources attributes. So for example, the mesh is a kind of resources attribute uh, and you will be able to set that mesh, that cone, um, to any resource from your engine, but you also have numerical attributes like vector three, um, vector four, floats, etc. And those can be accessed by uh, scripting in your engine. So typically in O3DE, those can all be accessed by script canvas node. Um, in UE, it will be accessed by blueprints or CPP, etc. So you can definitely drive all those from your engine. Yeah, and using them is pretty straightforward in Popcorn. Uh, when you've created one of them here, for example, Orbit Speed, well, when you hover them, you see where they're used in the graph. So here, this graph actually uses Orbit Speed. Uh, if I pick Fireworks U Spread and I just drag and drop it in there, it makes the node that I can then use as a regular float to into whatever computation I need. And that's something uh, in the specific case of O3DE, uh, that's something we will uh, probably present at the O3DE con. Uh, we will be doing a uh, one hour workshop. And um, in this workshop, I will probably show you how you can use the script canvas to drive some basic parameters uh, directly inside your 3 d So that will be uh, much clearer at that, uh, at that time. I think it's in uh, early October. Paul will be the one to yeah. <laughs> just announce this in video. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so we also did a little side uh, a few quality of life, of life improvement regarding the mesh user. So first thing is that you can now display animation curve from the mesh viewer, even if there is no geometry associated to that. So for example, here we have a circle. Um, I think we have a more complex one there. 
and those can be sampled inside the editor so can help you understand exactly what's going on because before it used to be uh yeah nothing displayed, yeah, nothing <laughs> displayed basically you have to so, guess exactly <laughs> you had to animate something in order to understand what was the curve um Regarding the geometry itself, maybe I think, uh, this one is yeah. probably or, or put money in there. I think I will it. open both. Yeah, okay. um, so another improvement is, is that you can now play animation. <laughs> you can now have uh, yeah uh, your animated mesh running inside the mesh viewer. There's also a new view that shows the bones of the mesh. Uh, which can be pretty useful to debug stuff and uh, skin the mesh. Um, we also added a way to see a vertex scores. So, for example, this mesh has only one stream, uh, which has a wide value, uh, one value on alpha, and this grayscale on RGB. Uh, let's try on this one. Yeah, this one has, <laughs> yeah, this is Popman. <laughs> this one has more fields. So from this menu, you can debug those. And those are the fields that are sampleable inside the graph. So it can be also useful to understand what's going on and uh, always be acting uh, your mesh. Um, there's also a small improvement we've done uh, with uh, camera rendering. Uh, let's open uh, yeah, this effect, for example. So the field of view of the editor camera is not hard-coded anymore, which is uh, not... Uh, not fantastic, but uh, <laughs> useful. Um, you can access the FOV of the camera from Editor Preferences and Effect Editor. Uh, we also expose near and far planes. So if I want to expose this, and now I have a like autographic like camera. Um, that way you can preview your effect in uh, something closer to what you might have in your engine if you have some specific. Uh, very wide or very narrow camera field of view. Uh, the new and the far plane can also mesh viewer. Uh, while the field of view is exposed the same way, the cl clipping plane are not exposed because uh, it uses uh, some heuristic to uh, create the, the best range uh, depending on the asset you're looking at. So you should not have to worry about that for mesh and vector field viewers, which are the two houses, uh, 3D viewers. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. I'm just maybe putting back this just in case. Um, so, good question. <laughs> it depends. It depends, yeah, it depends. <laughs> so for now, uh, for no speaking of O3D, because uh, I know you're using O3D, uh, it does not affect the mesh imported in O3D, but it's something that we will probably integrate uh, in upcoming version, at least for things like the scales, because you're able to rescale your uh, resource from Popcorn FX Editor. So I think we'd like to have the resource also scale inside O3D when you use one for sampling or rendering. So for now, no, but uh, yeah, that's something that, that might work in the future. Uh, and by the way, those uh, camera field of views and, and uh, tweaks, uh, they're in the editor preferences right now. So global to any effect editor you open. Ultimately, these uh, should be properties of a future camera backdrop, uh, but we're actually waiting to revamp that scene panel to have a proper scene graph before we do that. But you can expect that to be like a default camera for the scene that you select in this tree view and where you can uh, tweak the field of view and actually save it or maybe have multiple cameras or whatever. Just a little. Right. Yeah, that will be nice when we'll have that. <laughs> yeah. Not sure when we'll have that. But... <laughs> Uh, so, last thing for the stream, 
Uh, oh no, not last thing. Last no. thing for me. Then back to Hugo for optimizations. Uh, last thing I will show you uh, in this stream is the material adapter graph. Uh, so this is again a new 2.10 thing. I don't know why I opened the meshes. Uh, so for that, I will open an effect with mesh particles, oh. and I will revert all changes on the field of view. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. It's not the, the same one. Yep. project, right? Yeah. Spectator. Okay. Right. <laughs> so here we have this mesh render node. Uh, and if I select it, I can see various features, among which an emissive feature, for example. I'll use that as an example with the adapter graph. And here you can specify a material. Uh, here it's using the default mesh material. So if I open that material, this is where you see everything that the material supports. You have uh, the shaders, and you now have a new tab, which is a node graph tab. And what this allows you to do is to take every input of this renderer, modify it before it gets piped into your integration plugin or whatever. Uh, so this allows you to implement things that could be very uh, painful to do for artists because before that they would have to do those things inside the graph uh, directly. For example, uh, we've had some studios doing screen space uh, motion blur. Uh, for mesh particles, they needed the previous transforms uh, of the mesh. So the, they would need the position and the orientation of this frame, but also the position and orientation of the previous frame to properly compute the motion blur ve vectors. And to do that, you would have, for every effect that uses a mesh node, you would have to insert uh, a previous frame value node here, pipe it into a previous position pin of your mesh. Same thing for the orientation, pretty painful. So now with the adapter graphs, you can take this material, create, oh, <laughs> nice. So, <laughs> ta-da. Can you show the generic in the Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try that again. <laughs> Maybe there's an issue with the super cool feature. Uh, no, no, I tried it right, <laughs> right before. Uh, let me see. Popcorn effect score. Well, at least we will have the crash report. Maybe it was a cosmic ray. <laughs> Maybe it was a cosmic ray. Yeah, I think it was a cosmic ray. <laughs> right. <Nice. laughs> so uh, when you click on create new graph, you now have a rendering adapter graph. I'll reopen that effect. Right, and now. Uh, you can see that on the mesh node, you have this little red bar, which is indicative of a subgraph. You have that bar on template nodes. You don't have the, the, the red bar on built-in nodes because you can't open them by double clicking, uh, but you can open nodes that have the red bar. And so now the renderer node also has the red bar, which means that you can double click on it and you go into the rendering ad adapter, which is currently empty. So you don't see anything. Uh, but once you have that graph, you can do something such as uh, take the geometry mesh feature here, drag and drop it in there, and it will create uh, input and output nodes for all the properties and pins of that feature, well, all the pins technically, and pipe them uh, from input to output so that it acts as a pass-through. But what this means is that you can modify this. Uh, so for example, here I can, for whatever reason, uh, insert and add and uh, offset all the positions by one unit on the up axis, for example. And now my meshes are offset one unit up. Uh, but I can also take that, do a previous frame value, and pipe that into my 
previous position output for my material. Uh, so if I try to do that uh, like this, uh, I will get a warning because this does not exist in my current material. So obviously your shader needs to have a, a previous position input for this to work, but that's that's the, the idea. Uh, so I'll quickly show you something that actually works out of the box. Uh, so I'll take the emissive feature. I'll enable emissive in the preview here. And if I take that and let's say um, I multiply it by uh, whatever a color. So I'll pick some glowy, glowy value, 10. Maybe that's a bit too much. Right. So now whenever I will use emissive, all my particles will be automatically tinted by that color. And then obviously I can change the emissive color on top of that, but uh, yeah, this will allow me to get a default value. Uh, so tinting it like that isn't re really necessarily useful, but you can do other things such as test if the effect is running in the editor. And if it's not, multiply the emissive color by whatever value uh, to like, a, like 10, for example. And this would allow you to get the same uh, glow effects uh, in your engine, if your engine handles uh, glow uh, intensities differently from the popcorn editor, for example. So this is uh, just scratching the surface of what you can do in these adap adapter graphs. Yeah. Uh, and we've had uh, studios uh, typically doing that kind of stuff in C++ in the integration, and this allows you to do it in the graphs. It gets compiled with the rest of the graphs and optimized with the rest of the graphs. So also lower overhead uh, than uh, doing it in C++ actually. Can also uh, help a lot with upgrades. Uh, if, for example, your shader um, scale uh, becomes a half scale and you have to update all of your effects, you can simply divide the scale or multiply the scale by two inside the, the billboard and this will be seamless yeah. for all the artists using it. So it will simply work like that. Yeah, definitely. This is uh, something we actually had to make an upgrade for. Uh, when we went in, in one of the billboarding modes, uh, we went from the diameter to the radius at one point to unify it with the other yeah. billboards. Uh, same thing for the angles. At one point, we switched from radians to degrees and we had to make an upgrader that patched all graphs. Well, this is something that you can do inside the material adapter graph. Uh, yeah, also something that was asked uh, several times uh, is to add attributes in there. Oh, yeah, so sure. like you have uh, at the end of your production, it turns out you need to uh, scale down or scale up uh, whatever input of your render. You can add an attribute in that graph and it will be added automatically to all effects that use yeah. that material. So it's very powerful. You can use any nodes from the node graph, like uh, version logic or whatever. Yeah. You could even like query special layers in, in there, technically, even though probably would advise against <laughs> doing something like that. But in theory, you could even have physics node and another sim inside your material adapter graph if that made any sense. But it's just like a regular template node, so a regular subgraph. So you could do pretty much anything you you. Uh, so that's all for me. Do we have you any, any question? Uh, not yet, no. OK. I'm keeping an uh, eye on it. <laughs> so I just quickly finished by uh, wh what optimizations were done on uh, 2.10 specifically, and just a remark about uh, 2.9 LTS and uh, future optimizations. This um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So one of the optimizations is targeted at uh, layers specifically. Uh, we found in studio sending us uh, FX for review or that we often have this specific behavior of in the layer graph, a series of uh, layers doing stuff and then a platform switch node like uh, do this behavior only on uh, PS5, only this one on uh, Xbox uh, and, and so on. The issue is that with the previous versions, we still had uh, leftover layers being uh, compiled and part of the uh, final effect brought to the engine. Um, and one of the optimization paths we did is to properly remove any layer that basically does not contribute to the platform 
and uh, is being it's it's been baked. So there are uh, three specific steps. Uh, there are ones we call the removing layers that are that are of type pass through. So any layers are just wires, whatever is coming in uh, inside its output. So typically those nodes and layers that have uh, no life. So yeah. So so for example, here if I switch to uh, shipping and I'm in the console version. So the console version is set up to use this final layer, the low definition layer. We can see that that node, which did the switch and the high definition layers are not, it's a, it's a slight uh, grade, but uh, they are not part of the effect. It's uh, basically as if it was uh, like that. And if I switch to, uh, for example, PC, which will trigger the high definition, so same. This is removed and we only have that. So it's really useful for just those types of effects. Um, the other change is regarding curve folding optimization that Julian mentioned in the previous live stream. So not in this pack, just the campfire effect is a good example. Yeah, so in the curve editor, we can you can now select this uh, small fx uh, icon, and it will show you some information. So if it's displayed in green, it means that the curve could be converted to an, a math function, which is displayed here. Either it can be polynomial function, um, a Fourier function, or a Gauss, I believe, the third one. Yeah, Gaussian. Gaussian function. So here it says uh, it's green that so this this curve is very tr very simple so it was able to uh, convert this curve to a math function but if I do stuff like that we can see that the real curve that the artist created versus the the try math function diverges by a specific uh, ratio and it it says uh, it fails optimizing that curve basically. Uh, you have a control over that if you want to play with it in the curve optimization uh, setting. You can change it to manual just for testing. Uh, so by default, it's uh, point, uh, sorry, point zero 0.01. If you do point zero 0.02 in this specific example, it works. But uh, yeah, so just to play around with that value if you want to understand how it works. And if you move the key points, it can yeah, you can see it tries to fit with a, with a Fourier curve type, with a polynomial, and yeah, basically, uh, so, so you can preview your curves and see what gets optimized or not. And, and, and this converts the the more expensive sampling of the curve uh, to uh, a couple of math instructions. Yeah, as a typically, reminder, uh, going to... and to to give an order of magnitude, it's probably between at least five to 10 times faster than actually sampling the curve. So it's a pretty neat optimization. Yeah, just to be clear, the goal is that we do not recommend you to play around with that for each curve. Obviously, it's not uh, realistic, just it's a good way to, to try. And once we find a good threshold for all curves on our, on our end, uh, uh, yeah, we change that value. Yeah, the, the goal is really that you don't have to worry about it about yeah. tweaking any of that, we should do the work so that the optimizer can, by its own, do the right thing and optimize your effects. They're here just, uh, well, mainly for us to tweak things and debug things, but uh, yeah, maybe uh, in, in your entire project, maybe you would have two curves that you might want to tweak because you had traces on console that said, oh, this curve sampling is expensive, but you definitely shouldn't go in and think, okay, I'm going to hand tweak everything because it sounds good. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. <laughs> you don't it's need to. Math, math nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should also display the formula of, uh, yeah. Would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and finally, just a, a note regarding 2.9 LTS and 2.10. Uh, so, for example, 2.10.1 is going to un embed whatever changes were done in 2.9.11. And they are going to be that uh, duality for some time. So, 2.10.2 is going to embed uh, 2.9.12 and so on. 
but our focus uh, is to continue pushing optimizations on 2.9 and every time this gets merged into 10. Among the, the changes are, so I took a, a screenshot in, in UE4. We had this problem in, in several, uh, several production is uh, basically popcorn FX issues a lot of stuff to process on each uh, core and that hurts pretty bad on uh, low-end platforms. Uh, so this is a capture, it's very tiny, lots of information, but uh, you had the main thread at the top and each line below is uh, a 10 physical worker PC, CPU. Uh, the goal is to reduce the amount of tiny tasks that you can see, I hope you can see properly. So all of those, so this is a 296 capture and uh, this is 210, 210 one basically. So you can see everything is more packed. We are removing the overhead of just processing tiny tasks and just packing as much stuff as possible. Uh, there are other areas of, in, of, of interest, which is the end of Popcorn FX update, which we do lots of tiny stuff and uh, a final big, big task. So that's something we need to continue uh, to improve. But from 2.296, where I selected 1.7 milliseconds of frame time, uh, we can see in 2.10 that uh, this is the end of Popcorn FX update and stuff can start up, uh, happening way before. And this is on PC, on, on low-end platforms, it's, uh, it's even, even better. Uh, so yes. that's one of the things, uh, there are other stuff we cannot uh, mention, but uh, it's going right, di right direction. Yeah. Part of the uh, ongoing effort to lower various overheads and improve performance across yeah. the board. So yeah, pretty nice to see that. And I think that's it. Yeah. We can switch to our faces. Right, so that's it for the stream. Are there any questions? Well, I guess you ask them uh, along the way, but yeah, if any of you have any leftover questions, otherwise we'll wrap it up and yeah. you can always reach us on the Discord. Yeah. Yeah, there's a 10 second lag. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <yeah. laughs> okay, well, let's wrap it up then. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for being there and following the stream. And yeah. uh, see, see you on Discord. Time. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Yeah. Right. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. So sad. <laughs>